On this episode of China Uncensored, you know, they say money can't buy you love. Which is why love should be forcibly seized by the state and redistributed to the masses. Hi, welcome to China Uncensored. I'm your host, Chris Chappell. You know, the Chinese Communist Party is a lot like a not very good dad. Works long hours, never comes home for dinner, doesn't provide a social safety net, beats up human rights defenders, you know, the usual. The thing about a dad like that is he tries to make up for never being there by buying you cool stuff when all you really wanted was for him to go to your Little League games. Just one game. Yes, that's just what the Communist Party is like, which is what I'm talking about. The Chinese Communist Party, the CCP, wants you to love it. The problem is they've done some unlovable stuff. But they figured out a way around that. If they can get you to love China, then maybe you'll love the party as well. And what's not to love? A rich cultural legacy of 5,000 years of history, give or take the last couple of decades. Yeah, those last couple of decades did leave a mark. Now, they say any publicity is good publicity, but whoever they are, I don't think they had the Tiananmen Square massacre in mind. It was a PR nightmare. So the Communist Party needed a way to change China's image. And the answer was soft power. Soft power is the kind of cultural influence that makes people like you and want to be like you, like the popular kids at school. But after the Tiananmen Square massacre, no one wanted to sit next to China at the lunch table. Except for, like, North Korea, who was deeply uncool. So like in every teen movie, China got a makeover. A little less tanks and a little more... whatever these are supposed to be. So ignore that hacking and rapid military buildup. Here are five ways China is trying to buy your love. Number five. Chinese National Day. October 1st. It's kind of like Chinese Independence Day. Except instead of celebrating liberation from a foreign colonial power, it celebrates the day the Communist Party rebels liberated China from the Chinese government that was already there. The Communist Party took over the nation and quickly launched campaigns to take money from the wealthy, kill landowners and imprison intellectuals, and generally ensure a harmonious society. Cause for celebration. Seriously, the CCP actually exports its National Day celebrations all over the world as part of its soft power push. For example, in Vancouver, Chinese officials somehow convinced the mayor and another official to wear red scarves because they thought it was part of traditional Chinese culture. Yes, these same red scarves that the Communist Youth League wore when the CCP made them destroy Chinese traditional culture in the 1960s. You know it was successful propaganda because Chinese state media featured it. Number four. Rather than sending an army to invade your country, China is sending an army to invade your heart. An army of pandas. Just look at their cute ferocity. People love pandas. They work hard every day to bring you uncensored news and information about China and, oh no wait, I'm sorry, that's me. I don't really know what pandas do. But everyone still loves them for some reason. Yes, pandas are adorable. And most importantly, any government represented by a panda must be equally cute and cuddly. Who's a cute panda bear? You're a cute panda bear. Yes, you are. Yes, you are. Number three. Somewhere on the cuddle spectrum between panda bears and Xi Jinping, there's Confucius. The guy from 500 BC who arguably had a bigger influence on Chinese culture than anyone in history. Mao Zedong called him a peddler of feudal superstition. But eventually the Communist Party realized Mao's mistake and transformed Confucius into a peddler of propaganda. Since 2004, the Chinese regime has set up 500 Confucius institutes in 140 countries, plus 1,000 Confucius classrooms. It's a very tempting offer to schools around the world short on cash. The Chinese Communist Party provides free Mandarin language classes, as well as cultural programs like Chinese dance and cooking. Not at the same time. Or maybe at the same time. The point is, the Communist Party's former propaganda chief, Li Changchun, said that the Confucius Institute is an important part of China's overseas propaganda setup. Students will learn how great China's economic development is, but they won't be learning about, oh, I don't know, certain massacres that totally never happened, or a certain country that's not actually a country at all and just a normal province of China. Ever wonder how to say Tibetan Chinese? 
you might not want to ask. Number two, you say you want to be in pictures? Well, don't say anything critical about China or else you might end up like Richard Gere. China is the world's second largest movie market, but only allows 34 foreign titles a year. That means movies critical of China, or even overtly positive towards the U.S. government, won't be shown in China. So the Chinese Communist Party incentivizes Hollywood to self-censor or lose a huge chunk of potential box office money. On top of that, Chinese tycoons with shady party ties are buying up Hollywood. Chinese co-productions are becoming increasingly common, too. It won't be long before we start seeing movies like Little Big She or Jerry Maguire. And finally, number one. From schools to movies to even the zoos, it seems Chinese propaganda is everywhere. What's left? Why, the media, of course. While many media organizations around the world have struggled to survive, the Chinese government has been pumping huge sums of money into expanding state-run media to a global platform. In just a few years, party mouthpiece Xinhua opened nearly 50 new foreign bureaus and doubled the number of overseas correspondents. A few years ago, China Central Television set up its U.S. headquarters just a few blocks from the White House. And last December, they rebranded their international propaganda outlets as the friendlier-sounding China Global Television Network, so we wouldn't know. Xi Jinping told them to spread China's voice well and showcase China's role as a builder of world peace. But why just stick to their own media? State-run China Daily also pays struggling Western media like the Wall Street Journal and the New York Times to put their content in their papers and on their websites. And eventually, without most of us realizing it, the Chinese regime's limitless spending has wormed its way into our hearts. The public relations firm Portland Communications surveys the public on their opinion of 30 different countries. China used to be dead last, and now they're, well, at least they beat out the Czech Republic and Argentina. And that is money well spent. It seems money can buy you love. Sorry, John, Paul, George, and what's his face? But here's the thing. No matter how much the Chinese Communist Party spends to make people love China, and by extension, hopefully, the Chinese Communist Party, it's not going to work as well as good old-fashioned freedom of expression. Look at South Korea. It has 1 20th the population of China, but Korean dramas and K-pop are wildly popular all over the world. In 2014, at a leadership meeting in Beijing, Chinese officials lamented how China can't seem to make television as popular as Korean dramas. Some of the officials blamed it on the CCP's examination and approval system, i.e. censorship system, that encourages conformity rather than creativity. But somehow I don't think pouring billions of dollars into propaganda is the solution to that problem. So what do you think about China's efforts to buy your love? Has it bought your love? Leave your comments below. And be sure to show your love to China Uncensored. Hit that like and subscribe button. Thanks for watching this episode of China Uncensored. Once again, I'm your host, Chris Chappell. See you next time.